Education Mobile, quality e-learning experience on the go. Okay, yo, welcome to yet another biological section. Uh, today we're going to be looking uh, extensively at the topic at hand. Uh, the topic at hand is uh, still the nervous system. We're going to be looking at the neuron. Uh, don't forget this uh, program is uh, power packed by the Fusion Mobile e-learning uh, platform, a platform on the go, an academic platform on the go. And I remember my humble self, I'm Olajide, aka Smoking Brain, and it's good to, uh, to have you around. And now today we're going to be looking at the neuron, the neuron. What is the neuron? And this I'm going to outline definition of neuron are the parts of a neuron at the classification of neuron and the transmission of impulses across neuron and the functions of neuron. Uh, so now what is a neuron? What is a neuron? A neuron is the unit of a nervous system. A neuron is the unit of a nervous system. A neuron is the functional unit of a nervous system. Okay, so as I've said earlier, the neuron is the functional unit of a nervous system. The neuron makes up the nervous system. The neuron again is the functional unit of a nervous system. Uh, it also pleases me to introduce to you the parts of a neuron. Uh, the neuron is structured around three major parts. The neuron has got three major parts, three basic facts three basic parts and these parts are responsible for every actions uh, that are being conducted or carried out in the body and one of them is called the cell body the cell body the cell body is also known as soma s o m a the cell body or soma a soma is like a somatic for short uh, the cell body or soma the cell body or soma uh, the soma is made up of the nucleus and the cytoplasm the soma is made up of the nucleus and the cytoplasm don't forget the cell body of a neuron is called the soma it is made up of the nucleus and the cytoplasm it is like uh, the life unit uh, of a neuron the life unit of a neuron uh, like the coordination center the life unit itself of a neuron is called the cell body uh, so now the other part is called the dendrite 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 or uh, what is a dendrite a dendrite is a short cytoplasmic strand a dendrite is a short it is a short cytoplasmic it is a short cytoplasmic strand that conduct impulses towards the cell body the dendrite is a short cytoplasmic strand that conduct impulses towards the cell body. I think about the last time, the dendrite is a short cytoplasmic strand that conduct impulses towards the cell body. And the cell body, as we all know, is made up of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. And so, the cell body receives impulses from the dendrite. Dendrite conduct impulses are towards the cell body. Don't forget the impulses are electrical in nature. And so, we're going to be looking at the third on our list. And that's the exon. Exon. A X. O N exon 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 is a long fiber. The exon is a long fiber that conduct impulses. Ah, uh, the exon is a long fiber that conduct impulses. Ah, uh, that conduct impulses towards the cell body. Are you with me? The exon is a. Uh, a knife fiber that carries impulses rather away from the cell body. The dendrite carries impulses towards the cell body, and uh, the exon carries impulses away from the cell body. I think for last time, the dendrite carries impulses towards the cell body, and uh, they are short cytoplasmic strands. The exon is a long fiber, and it carries impulses away from the cell body. And uh, the exon is made up of a fatty sheet called a yelling sheet. It is made up of a fatty sheet. And that fatty sheet is called a yelling sheet. And this yelling sheet uh, is formed or made possible uh, with the help of the Schwann cells. Schwann cells. The yelling sheet is made possible or formed uh, by the action of the Schwann cells. The Schwann cells form the yelling sheet. The yelling sheet also have constrictions. <laughs> they have constrictions called the node of Ranvier. The node of Ranvier. You can see something like this. As a dendrite, you see another, you see another. Uh, so these constrictions here, they are called the node of Ranvier. The node of Ranvier. Again, uh, the yell, the exon have an outer layer called the neurilemma. The exon have an outer layer called the neurilemma. N-E-U-R-I-L-E-M-M-A. The neurilemma. Okay, so before now, we've looked at... Uh, some basic structures of the neuron, uh, we've looked at the cell body or soma, which is composed of the nucleus and the cytoplasm. We've looked at the dendrite, the dendrite rather, which 
uh, uh, short cytoplasmic strand are transmitting impulses towards the cell body. Towards the cell body. We've looked at exon, which is a long uh, of cytoplasmic strand, as the case may be, transmitting impulses away from the cell body. Now, it also pleases me to, in to introduce to you a particular one called the dendron. What then is the function of the dendron? The function of the dendron as well is to transmit impulses towards the cell body. What differentiates dendron from dendrite is that dendron is a long fiber. Why dendrite is a short cytoplasmic strand. Don't forget this important fact. So briefly we're going to be looking at the classification of the neuron. Neuron is basically classified into three. It is divided into three. It is categorized into three. Number one is the sensory neuron. Number two is the motor neuron. And number three is known as the intermediate neuron. The word intermediate speaks of coming in between. In between. The word sensory neuron uh, talks about uh, uh, the attachment or the association with sensory receptors. Are you with me? The word motor neuron talks about the attachment uh, with motor receptors. Motor receptors are the muscles at the glands. Uh, sensory receptors are those receptors attached to the nose, attached to the skin, those basic sense organs in the body. Are you with me? So now we're going to be taking the sensory neuron. What then is a sensory neuron? A sensory neuron it's a neuron that transmits impulses uh, that uh, it picks up impulses from the sensory receptor when it gets to the sensory receptor it says sensory receptors do you have any impulses the sensory receptor tends to say yes i've got impulses they pick impulses from the sensory receptors they pick these impulses straight to the central nervous system they pick it from the sensory receptors and they drop it at the central nervous system take note of this fact sensory neuron is also known as the afferent neuron Afferent neuron, afferent neuron. So they pick neuron from the sensory receptor and they transfer it straight to the central nervous system. Now, when they get to the central nervous system, the central nervous system divulges these impulses, transforms these impulses, translates these impulses. Are you with me? And so now the sensory neuron stops there. Don't forget the dendrite is attached to the sensory neuron, it is associated with the sensory neuron. And so now, what the motor neuron? The motor neuron is also known as the efferent neuron. The motor or the efferent neuron. What then is the function of the motor neuron? Recall, the impulses are held up at the central nervous system. It has been transformed, divulged, and translated. Something is about to happen. When the motor neuron gets straight to the central nervous system, it picks up this information and transmits it to the effector muscles and gland. They transmit it from the central nervous system to the effectors. The effectors, effectors, effector receptors, they are the muscles and the glands. So they transmit it uh, from the central nervous system to the effector, which are the muscles and the glands. Then they take action, they respond to it. It might be movement away or towards, they respond to it. So lastly, what the intermediate neuron? Intermediate neuron is also called the associate neuron. It is also sometimes called the relay neuron. It is also called the connector neuron. What is the function of the intermediate neuron? It connects the sensory neuron to the motor neuron. It connects them together. Don't forget, it connects them together. And usually in nature, the axon and the dendrite are usually associated with the central nervous system. So now we're going to be looking at the transmission of impulses. We're going to be looking at the resting potential and the action potential. We're going to be looking at our, how impulses came to be. We're going to be looking at the chemical messengers that are secreted at, at the extreme end of the of, uh, of the axon or the sign of the sign of the nerve junction. We're going to be looking at all these are. Uh, Critically. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at uh, the next on our outline, which is the transmission of impulses. How are impulses being transmitted in the body? We're going to be looking at them, and I would want you to follow me closely uh, because uh, most times it sounds like magic. You're like, ah, did you apply this one go like this? this guy is, uh. So you need to pay uh, proper attention so as to just uh, get this fact one and for all. So the mechanism of transmission involves the processes of transmission. It involves the movement of transmission. It involves the pathway of transmission. So I'm going to be looking at that. The mechanism of transmission are basically three. However, before we go deep into that, I would like to treat some important, uh, some important issues and that you've got to know even before this. Now, mechanism of transmission involves transmission across fibers and across synapses. Across fibers and across synapses. 
Don't forget what fibers are in the body. <laughs> and what the dendrites and what the exons are. Ah, fibers, fibers. Don't forget what fibers in the body. Those dendrites, they don't exons, they are, those are the fibers. And what synapse. A synapse is also known as a nerve junction. As I said earlier, where two nerves meet, a nerve junction. And I said they are not touching themselves closely. And so there is a gap there. We'll call it the synoptic gap. Are you with me? So in that synoptic at that particular point, uh, there is a chemical uh, transmission there, so to speak. So don't forget, there is a chemical transmission, uh, so to speak. So we have the fiber, which is what? Uh, the electrical. And we have the synapse, which is chemical. The fiber is electrical and the synapse is chemical. Now the three basic processes of uh, transmission of impulses are resting potential, action potential and repolarization potential what these three uh, speaks about briefly is that for resting potential there is no transmission of impulses for action potential there is polarization across the exon and for repolarization phase uh, there is a how do i say it uh, uh, there is a uh, a transformation back to the status quo there is a transformation back to the original level there is a transformation back to the beginning uh, back to the original status of the exon so we're going to be looking at the resting potential briefly resting potential what then is the resting potential and uh, the resting potential uh, speaks of a circumstances or a situation where there is no nerve impulses passing along fiber there are fibers but there are no nerve impulses there are fibers there are no movement of messages and uh, there are fibers but nothing is happening uh, across them so the resting potential is a state where there are no impulses uh, moving along the fibers there are no impulses impulses are not being transmitted so we say uh, the neuron is undergoing a resting state a resting potential now you need to take note a neuron has a net positive charge a neuron has got a net positive charge a neuron has got a net positive charge what does it mean uh, to say a neuron has got a net positive charge if for example now this is a neuron an hypothetical neuron a neuron has potassium on the inside and a neuron has sodium on the outside it has potassium on the inside it has sodium on the outside and now listen up there are more potassium on the inside than outside there are more sodium on the outside than inside even inside we have sodium but the concentration of sodium is less compared to potassium outside we have potassium but the concentration of potassium is less compared to sodium so when we have more potassium on the inside than outside when we have more sodium on the outside than inside then we say the neuron has a net positive charge the neuron has got a net positive charge don't forget it as a briefly we're going to be looking at the action potential the action potential the action potential and now it happens that the dendrite receives electrical impulses i need to follow me closely the dendrite receives electrical impulses uh, where are these uh, impulses from? Uh, the impulses are actually uh, transmitted by the, as you know, uh, they are transmitted by the dendrite, the dendron, and the exon. Uh, so it happens uh, that the dendrite receives electrical impulses. Uh, due to the presence of these electrical impulses, the exon become polarized. The exon become polarized. And uh, take note, it is actually the ends of this exon that becomes polarized. The ends of the exon become polarized. So when they become uh, polarized, uh, there happens to be a change. A change uh, in the polarization of the exon. The polarization of the exon is not just stopping at the tip. If it starts at the tip, it moves to the other side. Uh, so the direction is uh, unidirectional. It is unidirectional. So in this case, impulses are being transferred from the tip, uh, from the base down to the top, from the top down to the base. But it's actually going through one direction. So we say it is well, unidirectional. At this point, the exon is polarized. So we say uh, the situation, the circumstances, uh, the state of things at that particular point in time is Plane is polarization of the exon. So that's what we call the action potential. Uh, but uh, we cannot just stop there. There has to be a countermeasure uh, to all these changes. And what is this countermeasure? That's what we call the repolarization state. The third stage is the repolarization state. The repolarization stage simply talks about uh, the exon going back to the status quo, the exon going back to the original level, the exon being uh, the way it was from the beginning. So that's the third one repolarization stage 
so that's the third one, repolarization state. It talks about uh, the exon being depolarized, being depolarized, being depolarized, going back to the original state. That's what we call the repolarization state. Uh, the repolarization state also works uh, with the all unknown principle. All unknown principle. It simply means that uh, for impulses to be transmitted, uh, they have to get to a particular threshold. They have to get to a particular threshold before it will happen. If the threshold is here and the impulses are here, it will not be transmitted. But if the impulses are here, uh, are in line with the threshold frequency, impulses will be transmitted. And if they are above as well, impulses will be transmitted. So we're going to be going further as well. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at the action potential. What then is the action potential? Uh, so what happened uh, under the action potential is that the dendrite receive nerve impulses, the dendrite receive stimulus, the dendrite receive impulses, and uh, this leads to part of the exon becoming depolarized. What do I mean by depolarization? I told you initially that potassium is outside, so potassium is inside, sodium is outside. So for depolarization, sodium moves outside. Uh, uh, potassium moves outside, sodium moves inside when there are more concentration of sodium on the inside uh, than uh, sodium on the outside when there are more potassium on the outside than potassium on the inside we call it what depolarization and this depolarization is not just going to affect uh, the beginning of the exon it also moves to adjacent parts of the exon every part become affected at this stage the nerve fiber is said to be at action potential now we're going to be looking at the repolarization stage uh, which talks about a counter effect to the to the uh, uh, depolarization stage of the action potential. So now we're going to be looking at the repolarization phase. Uh, before the onset of the repolarization stage, uh, the inner side is electropositive relative to the outer side. Before the onset of repolarization phase, the inner side, the inner chamber, is more electropositive than the outside. And uh, so repolarization helps to do what? They have to re-establish potentials. Uh, they have to re-establish what kind of potential, so to speak, resting potential. Now, I told you that the inner state before the onset of repolarization is more electropositive than the outside. And uh, so what happened that uh, there is a wave of transmission of impulses. And this wave of transmission of impulses help to counter the effect of depolarization. And uh, so our resting potential is now what? Re-established. Resting potential from the onset is now re-established. However, there is a unidirectional transmission of impulses. Impulses move from base to all parts uh, of the fiber. From base to all parts of the fiber. And lastly, I would explain the all or none rule. What do I mean by the all or non rule? It simply means that for a fiber to be stimulated, for a fiber to undergo transmission, of, to, uh, to experience transmission of impulses across its ends, uh, then the, the nerve impulses must be equal to the threshold frequency. If this is the threshold frequency, the nerve impulses must be equal. If the nerve impulses is lesser than this, the threshold frequency, there won't be a stimulation of the fiber. But when it gets equal, there is a stimulation of the fiber. So now we're going to be looking at the transmission of uh, impulses chemically. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at the chemical transmission. We're done with the electrical transmission. Uh, we have looked at the resting potential, the action potential, and the repolarization phase. So we're really going to be looking at the chemical transmission. For the chemical transmission, I uh, take note, chemicals are actually secreted uh, at the ends of the axon. At the ends of the axons, chemicals are secreted. The ends of the axon is known as the synapse or nerve junction. At the nerve junction or synapse, chemicals are secreted. Now, impulses reaches the ends of an axon. Impulse reaches the ends of an axon at this region, what we call the synoptic knob. I told you initially that they are. Uh the exon and the dendrite, they are not end-to-end uh, -end closely uh, attached. Uh, there is a kind of space. So we call it the synoptic gap or the synoptic knob as the case may be. So at this particular point, uh, chemicals are secreted and these chemicals are called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. A-C-E-T-Y-C-H-O-L-I-N-E. Acetylcholine. They are secreted at this point. This acetylcholine helps to stimulate the dendrite. And this dendrite are... Uh, Passes information, uh, passes impulses to another uh, dendrite, which takes a uh, which takes uh, control of the whole transmission of impulses. However, uh, when there is uh, too much or uh, too many accumulation of the acetylcholine in the synoptic knob, a uh, cholinterase is secreted. Cholinterase is secreted. C H O L I N E T E R A S E. Cholinterase is secreted. What is the function of the cholinterase? The function is to inactivate 
acetylcholine. The function is to inactivate acetylcholine so that there won't be accumulation in the synaptic nerve. As soon as we are going to be looking at the functions of a neuron. The basic function of a neuron is to transmit impulses from sensory receptor down to the central nervous system, from the central nervous system uh, down to the effector muscles and actions are taken. We also have another on our list is the integration of reflex action. Uh, this is done by the intermediate neuron. Integration simply means uh, all parts working together in harmonization, uh, trying to merge uh, a particular part uh, with another particular part to achieve a set goal. So that's integration of reflex action and this is carried out by uh, the intermediate neuron. What is reflex action? I'm not going to tell you now. I was still going to be looking at it uh, after this. Uh, so on our list, again, we have the awareness of our environment. Uh, sensitivity to touch, uh, sensitivity to cold, sensitivity to pain are all carried out by the nerve fiber. Lastly, uh, the neurons help to keep us alive. Whenever we are asleep, the autom autonomic nervous system, which, uh, which is concerned with involuntary actions, uh, gets to work. A very good example is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve. Uh, so briefly, we're going to be looking at uh, uh, reflex actions, condition reflex, uh, difference and similarities, and we're going to be having a nice time. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at reflex action. Reflex action. The word re reflex talks about uh, something that is not planned. It talks about a response beyond your control. It talks about something that just happened. You know, you're just, how did I do it? That is a reflex action. An action that is not, uh, is not scripted. It's not written over. You, you just happen to do it. And one thing about it is that it is stereotyped. You tend to do it over and over again. You say, no. If it comes again, I won't do it. Before you know you've done it. Yes, that's why it's called reflex action. Yes, it's reflex action. And so basically, we're going to be looking at reflex action. What are reflex actions? Reflex actions are involuntary actions. Involuntary actions. It's not about an action that is uh, beyond your control. Involuntary action. I uh, one thing about reflex action is that it is a quick response. Before you know, it is done and dusted. It is a quick response. It is automatic. It is beyond your control. Beyond your will. Uh, beyond your, I want to do it this way. It is not planned. And that is why it's called reflex action. It involves minimum number of cells. Nerve cells to be precise. It involves minimum number of nerve cells. And lastly, it terminates. It terminates in the spinal cord. It terminates at the spinal cord. Oh, that should be the correct thing. It terminates at the spinal cord. The whole thing ends at the spinal cord. If every example is a blinking of your eyes, blinking of your eyes. Before you know, you know, daily you blink your eyes. Someone wants to uh, uh, kind of uh, put his hand into your eyes and you're like this. You want to protect yourself. And most times uh, you see a bay. Uh, that one is actually land. You see a bay and you're like, yeah, that one is not blinking of your eyes. That one is, is different. That one is... You're checking a bit, so it's different, but natural blinking of eyes, I don't cause naturally. I don't know what salivation, even right now I'm salivating, I've got a uh, 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 speed saliva on uh, the surface of my tongue. Salivation is also automatic, beating of the heart, bing, bing, my heart is beating, uh, it has been uh, uh, said uh, by lots of people, and it stands true that the day your heart stops beating, uh, that day you are confirmed dead. Uh, so beating of the heart, and it will interest you to know that the heart beats 72 times in a minute. The heart beats 72 times in a minute. Last we have jacking of knee. Jacking of knee. Jacking of knee. You want to you want to jack your knee. Jacking of knee. It's very, very uh, it's a kind of funny stuff, stuff, so to speak. I don't know most times I would be sleeping and all of a sudden I'll just jack my knee and I'll be like, ah, I have to control this. Ah, well it can be controlled. And so that's all you need to know about reflex action. So now we're gonna be looking at voluntary action. We're gonna be looking at voluntary action next. Now, voluntary action, let me quickly put it down on the board. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at voluntary action. We just looked at reflex action. We're going to be looking at voluntary action. What is a voluntary action? A voluntary action is a delayed response. It is not a quick response. It is not inborn uh, like that of reflex action. Reflex action is inborn. Voluntary action is not inborn. It is controlled by the brain. Take note. Reflex action is not consciously controlled by the brain. It's not, it's not only like I want to do, it's not consciously controlled by the brain. But voluntary action is consciously controlled by the brain as it involves many nerves. It involves uh, many parts uh, 
of the body. And one thing you need to know about voluntary action is that your response to it might vary. You might decide to respond this way today, you might respond this way tomorrow. As you tend to advance in age, uh, you tend to mature, you tend to know how to respond uh, better. Examples are singing, driving, jumping, teaching, writing, shouting. Uh, what else? I'm dancing right now. Are you with me? So that's a voluntary action. Voluntary action. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, the next outline uh, on our list as well. Okay, so now we're, we're going to be looking at the reflex act. The reflex act. The reflex act. Uh, the word act talks about a pathway. Uh, it talks about a passage. It talks about uh, uh, a detailed movement along a path. It talks about a reflex a repeated movement along a path. It talks about a predictive movement. Like, you know, this is the path it will take. This is how it will go. It will get from here to here and here to here and here to here. That's what we call, a, and that's what we call an arc. So a reflex arc talks about an arc uh, one that is associated with involuntary action. Now, a reflex arc is a pathway of a reflex action. A reflex arc is a pathway of a reflex action. It talks about how impulses are being picked and how response is made to that impulses. It talks about impulses and response to the impulses. Impulses and response to the impulses. It talks about somebody slapping me and how I respond uh, to the slap. Are you with me? It talks about impulses and response to the impulses. It is the pathway of a reflex action. A reflex act has got many parts, uh, ranging from the sensory cells to the sensory neuron, to the intermediate neuron, the motor neuron, and lastly, to the effector. What is the function of the sensory cells? The sensory cells picks up impulses. Picks up impulses like when uh, a, a kind of needle pricks you, the sensory cells are uh, located in your skin, uh, will pick up the impulses. The sensory neuron picks up uh, these impulses and takes it to the central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. The intermediate neuron picks it from there, picks it from uh, the brain and the spinal cord, notably the dorsal root, and it goes down to the ventral root, and it comes down uh, to the motor neuron. The motor neuron picks it from the intermediate neuron and drops it at the effector. The effector at the muscles and glands, and this effector takes charge of the action. So the response is seen. Is seen. So lastly, we're going to be looking at the condition uh, reflex. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at conditioned reflex. The word conditioned means a learned, programmed, a programmed reflex or a conditioned reflex. A conditioned reflex is a learned response after birth. After you are giving birth to those things uh, you learn to do, uh, like you learn to walk, you learn to drive, you learn to speak. Those things are called conditioned reflex. Ah, uh, one thing you need to know again about conditioned reflex is that it starts with the brain. It starts with the brain. You get you program it with the brain. You you center it around your brain. Uh, all your energy and uh, you garner it towards the brain. And once you've learned it, uh, you become a professional in it. One thing you need to know as well is that it takes time. You don't just, it doesn't just come out of the moon. You don't just learn it in a day. There are some you learn in a day, uh, but uh, you get to perfect it over time, over time, over time. And uh, one thing again is that uh, when you tend to practice it over and over again, you become a master in it, just like singing as well. So now I'm going to talk about the experiment of this wonderful man, Ivan Pavlov. Ivan Pavlov in 1902. He did uh, something that is so uh, extraordinary, and today we still talk about him. Uh, so this particular man performed an experiment uh, using a dog. Uh, so whenever he goes to feed the dog, whenever he goes to feed the dog, he goes there with a bell. Now, even before making the bell, he noticed that uh, whenever he gets there and the dog sees the food, the dog will salivate naturally. It will bring out a uh, spit sort of on his dog. <laughs> the dog will salivate. So he kept on doing this. Uh, then later on, what he does is that he will come with bell. He will ring the bell without bringing food. You know, initially he's always bringing food. Once he brings the food, the dog will salivate. The dog will salivate. He comes with bell. He rings the bell. He gives the food. Uh, to the dog, if you ring the bell, he gives the food. A time now, okay, when he will ring the bell, he will not bring the food. So the dog is used to the ringing of the bell and taking of the food. Uh, so whenever he rings the bell, he fails to bring out the food. Once uh, the dog just uh, hears the sound of the bell, he starts salivating, even without seeing food. So that means the dog has been programmed to believe that uh, after uh, the sound of a bell comes enjoyment. As we usually say, uh, after the night comes uh, a brighter day, a brighter morning. Uh, so it's been a wonderful time out with you. So questions will pop up on your screen. Share as much as possible to attend there. Should you be having any issues uh, with what I've been taught so far? Are you having any constraint? Go back, uh, sit down with the video, embrace the video, enjoy the video. See you soon.